Good morning. My name is Peter Hay, and uh, I'm standing in the sanctuary of the Wilmington United Methodist Church, and members of the worship team have gathered to uh, offer this experience of a weekend worship video. And uh, I invite us now to stand and to offer our hymn of praise, Wellspring of Wisdom. Won't you sing with me? It's a pleasure to welcome to our worship team this morning our lay reader for the day. Ed Terrell will uh, read Holy Scripture for us. So, Ed, we bid you welcome and are glad that you're with us. I will be reading Psalm 92 today, and we will do it responsibly. It is good to praise you, Yahweh, and celebrate your name in song, Most High, to proclaim your love in the morning and your fidelity through the watches of the night. To the music, to the string trade, and the melody of your heart. Your needs, Yahweh, fill me with joy. I shout in triumph over the work of your hands. How great are your works, Yahweh! How profound your thoughts! Thou who don't re realize this so senseless, and they are fools because they can't understand that though the corrupt keep springing up like grass and all evildoers blossom and flourish, it is only so that they will be destroyed forever. For you, Yahweh, reign on high forever. Come and watch your foes, Yahweh. Come and watch your foes perish and all evildoers will be scattered. I have raised my horn high strong as the wild ox. I am anointed with fine oil. With my own eyes, I have seen the defeat of my enemies, and I have heard the downfall of my cruel foes. And just live like a palm tree and grow as tall as the cedars of Lebanon. Transplanted in the house of Yahweh, they flourish in the courts of the highest. Still full of sap in all age, they see the abundant life, eager to declare that Yahweh is just, my rock, in whom there is no wrong. It is a pleasure to uh, welcome Denise Farnsworth, uh, one of our lay leaders here, to share with us the children's message. Denise has been sharing those messages from her home, but we're, today we're delighted to have her with us to do so. Denise, we bid you welcome. So the children's story this week is based on a familiar parable of Jesus 
called The Good Samaritan. And I just want to read a little bit of the author's note. We're going to be reading the book called Who is My Neighbor? by Amy Jill Levine and Sandy Eisenberg Sasso. And it's illustrated by Denise Turo. And in the back, a note for parents. The word parable comes from two Greek words, para, as in parallel, means to put something side by side. Bala means to cast or to throw. Thus, a parable casts two images side by side, the story in the text and the story of our own lives. When we explore that connection, we think about our relationships and our place in the world, and we consider how we can be better people. So the parable traditionally called the Good Samaritan appears in the Gospel Luke. And we're going to see what the authors did today with the story, and I think you'll find it fitting with the scripture lesson and today's sermon as well. So, who is my neighbor? Love your neighbor as you love yourself, and love the stranger, because you know that it was like what it was like to be a stranger. Once there was a town where only blues lived. They were navy and indigo, aqua and sapphire, powder blue and midnight blue. They planted irises and forget-me-nots and feasted on blueberries and blue cheese. They sailed on blue waters. Blue jays perched on branches and brilliant blue cracker butterflies shimmered. The blues thought they were the coolest colors. The yellows lived in a different town. They were gold and brown, lemon and mustard, canary and pale yellow. They planted sunflowers and daffodils and feasted on bananas and butterscotch pudding. They traveled on yellow brick roads. Goldfinches perched on branches and busy yellow jackets buzzed. The yellows thought they were the hottest colors. The blues and the yellows did not like one another very much. Be careful of the yellows. We are better than they are. They are not our neighbors. They warned their children not to go near the others. Be careful of the blues. We are better than they are. They are not our neighbors. For years, the blues said there was no such thing as a good yellow. And the yellows said that there was no such thing as a good blue. One day, Midnight Blue put on his best blue helmet, got on his bike, blue of course, he loved cruising under the bright blue sky and passing by the tranquil blue lakes, singing a bluegrass tune. Then out of the blue, someone passed by so close to midnight blue that he tumbled and lost his balance. Bump, thump, midnight blue tumbled to the ground. His knees started to turn black and blue. Midnight blue needed help. Along came Navy. Navy will help me, Midnight Blue thought, but Navy was afraid. She wondered, maybe someone made Midnight Blue fall, and maybe that person is still around. So Navy pretended not to notice Midnight Blue. Midnight Blue was surprised. Why hadn't Navy stopped to help? After all, Navy was his neighbor. Along came Powder Blue. Powder Blue will help me, Midnight thought. But Powder Blue wondered, did Midnight Blue get in a fight? Is another person still around? He was afraid, so he pretended not to notice Midnight Blue. Midnight Blue was surprised again. Why hadn't Pow Powder Blue stopped either? After all, Powder Blue was his neighbor. Neither Navy nor Powder Blue is true blue. Along came Lemon. Oh no, a yellow, thought Midnight Blue, a yellow. A yellow will make things worse. Maybe this yellow will steal my books. But Midnight Blue wasn't the only one who was scared. Lemon worried about helping. A blue. What if that blue wanted to trick her? What if that blue jumped up and took her bike? Maybe she should just hurry on by. But Lemon didn't hurry by. She decided to help. She didn't steal his books. She picked them up. She lifted Midnight Blue from the dirt. 
handed him his helmet and helped him get on the back of her bike. Then she took him to her doctor. While they waited, Lemon gave Midnight Blue a butterscotch cookie. It was a little broken, but still delicious. Midnight Blue said, you're a good yellow, not like the others. Most yellows are good, Lemon said. Well, so are most blues, Midnight Blue said. And he smiled, and he pulled out a small bag of blueberries and gave some to Lemon. They were a little squished, but still yummy. When Dr. Gold came out, Midnight Blue was still a bit frightened. Dr. Gold was another yellow, but Dr. Gold smiled at him. She shined light into his eyes, checked to make sure nothing was broken, and stuck a bandage on each knee. Midnight Blue turned to Lemon and said, thank you for helping me. I would like to be your friend. Lemon nodded, of course, a good friend. When Midnight Blue returned to his town, he told all the blues what had happened. It was not at all what they expected to hear. He said, Lemon did not go passing by. Lemon did not look the other way. Lemon helped, and Dr. Gold did too. The blues thought, hmm, the yellows do not look like us or eat the same food as us, but maybe the yellows can be our friends. When Lemon returned to her town, she told all the yellows what had happened. It was not at all what they expected to hear. She said Midnight Blue wasn't mean at all. He was thankful. He shared his blueberries. So sweet. From now on, we are going to be friends. And the yellows thought, hmm. The blues do not know our songs or grow our plants, but maybe we can help that blues, and the blues can help us. From that time on, the blues and the yellows began to say, maybe we don't have to look alike or even live nearby. Perhaps we will like hearing new songs and tasting new foods. We might like making new friends, and maybe we can all help one another. Maybe, said Midnight Blue, and Lemon smiled. Maybe, just maybe. Thank you. Our scripture lesson today comes from the Old Testament. The book of Proverbs, chapter 18, verses 1 through 7, as follows. The one who lives alone is self-indulgent, showing contempt for all who have sound judgment. A fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing personal opinion. When wickedness comes, contempt comes also, and with dishonor comes disgrace. The words of the mouth are deep waters. The fountain of wisdom is a gushing stream. It is not right to be partial to the guilty or to subvert the innocent in judgment. A fool's lips bring strife, and a fool's mouth invites a flogging. The mouths of fools are their ruin, and their lips a snare to themselves. This is the reading of the day. Thanks be to God. My right. 
Well, I'm going to venture into a, uh, a hot topic on this uh, weekend. And uh, I suspect that some of you are probably preferring that I didn't. But one of the values that we've adopted in our strategic plan is that we want to be relevant to today's world. The topic of race has been very prominent of late. And talking about it might be somewhat controversial, but I would argue that not talking about it would make us irrelevant. And you've clearly said that you don't wish to be irrelevant. I've always appreciated the wisdom of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. And to uh, summarize one of my favorite quotations from him, I would say this. The church is neither the master of the state nor its slave. The church is to be the conscience of the state. We aren't the usual ones to boss society around, nor is it our role to be bossed around, but it's our job to speak truthfully and honestly about what we believe and how we understand the nature of our God. So in this sermon, I will tell you what a systematic view is and why I think it's a valuable tool to use in many different areas. Then I would like to show you in the book of Proverbs how a systematic view is inherent in the wisdom of the ancient Hebrew people. And then I'd like to suggest a few benefits that we might glean by evaluating our present racial tensions through a systemic lens. Well, let me start with a little less controversial uh, experience to illustrate the value of a systemic view. Now, I've been here in Wilmington for about a year, and I don't know if you remember or not, but when I first came, I was limping a fair amount. I was in a little bit of pain in my knee, and uh, when it flared up, I'd limp quite a bit. Well, I went to see a doctor. Her name was Dr. Gold, actually, and she was wearing a yellow blazer. And after the consultation, at the consultation, the doctor did a very comprehensive examination of my knee, bending it in all the ways that it was supposed to bend and making sure it could move and then trying to bend it in all the ways that it wasn't supposed to bend, making sure it didn't do that. And after a very thorough examination of my knee, the good doctor completed the direct analysis and then stepped back and took a more systemic view. Her first question, you just moved. Yes, I replied. The follow-up question from the doctor, when you moved, did you lift lots of heavy objects and go up and down the stairs far more frequently than you would have? Yes, I did, and so did a lot of other people. <laughs> the conversation then took 
a different tact, tract. Dr. Gold looked at me and said, um, would you mind telling me a little bit about your weight? I began to feel just a, a little embarrassed, but I fessed up, and the confession was good for the soul, and it turned out good for my body as well. The professional opinion was that I had arthritis in my knee, that I had aggravated that knee in the moving process, and that I had gained weight, and putting weight, that additional weight, had added to the stress. In the professional opinion, she said, every extra pound that my body carried contributed to the pain in the knee. Well, I, I felt a little vulnerable and uh, did not like hearing Dr. Gold say what Dr. Gold said, but grateful that she did. So I was a little more honest, and I shared with the doctor that I was tried some things to lose weight, but everything I tried was not very successful. Well, the good doctor described an anti-inflammatory for me, saying I could take it up to three times a day as needed, and suggested I look into an online app that helps people to lose weight, and I did. So I started using both the daily medication and following this plan. Since then, I've lost a little, I've lost a little weight, and I'm only taking that anti-inflammatory three days a week. It was when the doctor stepped away from simply focusing on the knee and asking the broader systemic questions about my life that there was a solution. And I'm very grateful for Dr. Gold's wisdom. And after a quick romp through the book of Proverbs, I'll try to apply that model to some of the racial tensions that we are experiencing in our present moment. Now, the book of Proverbs is a collection of sayings, little nuggets of wisdom that have been preserved for us from the Hebrew people. You might enjoy reading through them sometime when you, when you have a, a few moments. They're filled with great nuggets of wisdom. And of course, they always remind me of many of the sayings that uh, my father was particularly fond of. He would say to me over and over again and helping me to learn and to grow. And in the beginning of the 18th chapter, there are a series of these proverbs that teach us to be respectful of wisdom, to be disciplined with our speech, and to do all that we can to prevent the wicked from depriving the innocent of justice. And in this chapter, I find some encouragement to take this systemic view of our present racial tensions. Now, I do not believe for one moment that one simple sermon around this topic is going to uh, alleviate everything. And it certainly won't be as neat as the opening illustration for this sermon. But I would make this recommendation that after we have thoroughly analyzed 
every racial encounter that seems to have gone wrong to start asking more profound and wider questions, questions about history, questions about power. I'd like to suggest for you a couple of resources that can help us do that. There is a very, very compelling documentary right now on Netflix. It's called 13th. The title comes from the 13th Amendment to the Constitution of the United States. That's the one that abolishes enslavement. It is a very comprehensive walk through American history on the matters of race. It's, it's hard to watch. You will see things that you really can never unsee again. You will learn things that will be difficult to take from your conscience mind once they get there. But I pray that you have the courage to watch it and to learn. There's a whole lot more to this problem than the immediacy of the problem that flares before us in the moment. There's a long history that can help us understand. And I would also please ask you to pay attention to the, our denomination. I would like to be among the first to celebrate that I think our denomination is putting forward a very honest and sincere effort to begin to explore issues of race from a systemic expression. On Sunday afternoon at 6 p.m., five of our United Methodist bishops will be offering uh, um, their wisdom and their perspective on this, one of whom is uh, Latrell Easterling. She was from New England when she was elected to the Episcopacy, and I'm honored to count Latrell as one of my friends. I'll post that on the church Facebook page so you'll have the access. I'm planning on watching it, and I hope that you will watch it with me. And I have one more urgent reason for you to believe with me that a systemic evaluation of racism will help us. I believe that a systemic evaluation will not only help us protect people of color, but it will also help us to protect and to understand the overwhelming majority of good and honorable members of law enforcement. And I know that some of those very good folks are feeling blamed, feeling vulnerable right now. And I believe that they also are entitled to our best efforts. And a systemic understanding will help us to do that and to do it well. Well, I trust that you have found these words helpful. I've tried to use the analogy of an arthritic knee and limited success at weight loss as an invitation to a more comprehensive exploration of a present problem, a problem that has all of us limping and feeling vulnerable. Amen. We are so grateful for your continued generosity.
Your faithfulness in uh, sending your gifts helps the church remain vital in its witness and its outreach. You can support the church by uh, um, going to the website and following the prompts for online giving, and it will easily walk you through how you can make a gift in that way. You can go to your bank and you can set up a gift and a reoccurring gift um, if you'd like to do so, so that your support is regular and dependable. And if you want to, you can always do it the old-fashioned way by sending a check into the church office. But please know that, please know not only are we grateful, but that your gifts are used for very important ministries, both here in the town of Wilmington and in the wider world that God has blessed us with. So I thank you for your support and for your generosity. I woke up this morning, saw a world full of trouble now, thought, how do we ever get so far down? And how's it ever gonna turn around? So I turned my eyes to heaven. I thought, God, why don't you do something? Well, I just couldn't bear the thought of living in poverty and people sold into slavery the thought disgusted me so i shook my fist at heaven I said god why don't you do something he said i did i created you There are two things I would invite us to think about and pray to, and to pray about together uh, today and in the week to come. 
The first is to uh, offer prayers of ongoing support. Uh, you may remember a while ago we prayed for H&H, uh, &H, uh, a uh, family uh, that had been married, a uh, couple that had been married for many, many years, and uh, uh, the spouse died and died of COVID. I spoke uh, again this week with uh, the spouse that, that is surviving, and that person spoke with, uh, with great gratitude telling me that uh, he's received over 70 cards from members of this congregation expressing support and encouragement. And um, on that person's behalf, I say a word of thank you. And I'd also like to tell you that earlier in this week, we had a meeting of our Council on Ministries as we're uh, embracing the strategic plan. And many of the groups within the church have read it and have been energized by it and sending in ideas to help us fulfill it. So please continue to keep the church in your prayers as we grow, grow into, that, into that plan. It's now my delight and my joy to uh, invite Jenny Hippel to come and lead us in our morning prayers with the prayers of the people that come from the Episcopal Book of Common Prayer. Won't you join me as I pray? I ask your prayers for God's people throughout the world, for our Bishop Devadar, for this gathering, and for all ministers and people. Pray for the church. I ask your prayers for peace, for goodwill among nations, and for the well-being of all people. Pray for justice and peace. I ask your prayers for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, and those in prison. Pray for those in any need or trouble. I ask your prayers for all who seek God or a deeper spiritual connection. Pray that they may found by grace. I ask your prayers for the departed. Pray for those who have died. Praise God for those in every generation in whom Christ has been honored. Pray that we may have the grace to glorify Christ in our day. And as we are taught, so now we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Before we sing our final hymn and have the blessing of the morning, I would like to again say a word of thanks to those of you who gathered here this day to uh, help lead in this weekend worship video. And I would like to share with you that each Sunday morning uh, through the summer, we will have a, a brief service of Holy Communion. It'll be out, outdoors. Um, we would like it if you'd make reservations beforehand so we know who's coming. Uh, but you can still come even if you weren't able to do that. Uh, but be sure to check in with the person who's taking names. It's critical that we have an absolutely accurate list of who's present and the outside chance that there is a need for contact tracing, we want to be able to hand that list very quickly to the person that would be caring for that. And uh, you would be most welcome to receive Holy Communion in that way if you so desire. So let us sing, Behold a Broken World. Behold 
We have a tradition here at the Wilmington United Methodist Church to, uh, to honor those in our number who have graduated. And uh, one of our lay leaders, Denise Farnsworth, will lead us in such a recognition. Denise? I had the honor to do one last special celebration with Kim before she uh, left us this past week. Kim Gold, Pastor Kim. And we went around Wilmington to deliver um, the traditional blankets to our high school graduates and a small prayer in a keychain with a cross uh, and a certificate honoring their accomplishments. Um, and I wanted to share some of the graduates that we were able to visit with and where they graduated from and where they'll be heading. So from Wilmington High School, Sarah Cheney graduated. She'll be attending UMass Lowell as a math major. We visited with Dean Nally, and he's excited to be going to Bentley University. He's going to most likely study actuarial science, and he's hoping that he will have a season for playing football with them, but he will be on their football team. Uh, we saw uh, Skylar Smith. She'll be attending Emerson College, majoring in political science and public relations. From Tewksbury High School, we were able to honor Heather Conley. She'll be attending Middlesex Community College and studying early childhood education. Jessica Lasecki is another high school graduate from Tewksbury High. From Austin Prep, we visited with Charlie Burnham. He'll be attending Tufts University. His major will be declared at a later date, so stay tuned for that. From Shawsheen Tech, we visited with Matt Giacalone. He'll be attending Wentworth Institute of Technology. He had his, uh, his sweatshirt on announcing that when we, when we came. And he'll be studying architecture. We, we visited with Ben Kingston, and he'll be attending Montserrat College of Art to study illustration. And our two college graduates we're very proud of as well. Emily Burke graduated from Merrimack College with a BA in English Literature and Theater Arts. And she started the next day into grad school for her master's degree in higher education back at Merrimack College, which she has a fellowship for there as well. And Elizabeth Olson graduated Worcester State with a BS in Public Health. And she too will be going on to Regis College to study nursing. So we wish them all the best, we've watched them grow, and we celebrate with them and their families the great accomplishments that they have done through their schooling. Thank you. 
Well, Denise, thank you for sharing those uh, wonderful achievements with us this day. And, uh, and now may that peace of God that passes all understanding keep our hearts and our minds in the knowledge and the love of God and of that precious child, Jesus. And may the one who creates us, who redeems us, and who sustains us be with us now and always. Amen. Thank you.